Today's episode is sponsored in part by Palo Alto Networks and its Prisma Sassy, where AI-powered innovation takes center stage. Watch the new Palo Alto Networks virtual event on demand to hear how the latest innovations in Sassy can help your organization. See how ZTNA 2.0, Cloud Secure Web Gateway, and SD-WAN deliver exceptional security and ROI. Watch on demand at paloaltonetworks.com slash engage slash sassy dash signature dash moment. Welcome to Heavy Networking, the flagship podcast from the Packet Pushers. I'm Ethan Banks, and co-hosting with me is Drew Conray-Murray, and we invite you to follow or connect with us on LinkedIn, where we post regularly. On today's episode, we discuss networking sources of truth. That's right, I said sources of truth, because you're likely to have more than one, depending on your environment and your point of view. Joining Drew and me for this Sources of Truth discussion are Dinesh Dutt, Principal and Co-Founder at Stardust Systems, Claudia DeLuna, an Advanced Technical Consultant with a Specialty in Network Automation, Yvonne Pepelniak, Network Architect, Author, Network Blogger, and Instructor, and David Sin, a Network Engineer whose work history includes Cisco, Cumulus, and AWS. Let me set up this conversation briefly for you. On LinkedIn, I quoted someone at the AutoCon Zero conference back in November 2023, and that person essentially said that the network itself shouldn't be used as a source of truth, that your source of truth needs to be your intended network state and not your actual network state. And this sparked a lengthy series of comments with all kinds of viewpoints. And some people agreed with me and the person that I was quoting, and some people disagreed. And on some level, it felt to me like we're arguing about what words mean, and we're kind of missing the point entirely. Now, Dinesh and I exchanged a few comments, and he agreed to be on this episode to discuss and requested a few other people join us who might have alternate points of view, thus the unusually large crowd of guests that we have for today's episode. So here we go. Uh, Dinesh, as I said, this this podcast episode is largely your fault, so I'm going to throw the first question to you and everyone else. uh, Join in as you have things to say. So Dinesh, from a networking perspective, what is a source of truth and why do we need one or more than one of them? Uh, let me start off by thanking both you, Ethan and Drew, for making this episode happen. I'm really thrilled that to kick off the new year with so many of my friends on this call. So, you know, this is just another way for me to get everyone that I enjoy chatting with to be on the call. So thank you for making that happen. Uh, but I think, you know, from another perspective, re- seriously, though, this is a topic that merits some discussion because like so much in networking, uh, things are polarized, I guess, so much in the world, uh, when there is so much actually that we agree upon. So with that, let's get to your question. What is a source of truth and why do we need one? I think like in real life, anyone who's seen Rashomon knows there is no truth with a capital T in this world, no matter whether it is uh, your uh, favorite pastor or your priest who tells you that there is only a small T and that applies to networking as well. And the main point that I would like to start from, rather than argue about whether tea or coffee is better for uh, uh, morning coffee or for morning caffeine, talk about why do we need morning caffeine instead? Why do we need a source of truth? What is the genesis of this experiment that we are now having in network automation? So for me, I don't believe, so to answer your question, there are many sources of truth because when I want to know if a link is down, pick your favorite source of truth that is not the state of the network, it's going to be wrong. When I want to know whether VLAN 100 is IP address 10.1.1.1, you can say what it ought to be, but what is, is what is. So Mm -hmm. again, I think this whole discussion of source of truth is to me actually, um, how shall I say, a finger pointing at the moon, but forgetting the moon and still focused on the finger a little bit. (laughs) Pick your favorite (laughs) finger, but it's focused on the finger. Uh, But the point I'm trying to make is, I think fundamentally in networking, we have had a lot of this discussion because there are multiple perspectives to be looked at. The first perspective I would present why this current discussion around source of truth, intended, expected, current, et cetera, is because around of network automation. For much of networking history, the data we care about, what VLANs do I have in my network, what IP addresses are assigned to what VLANs, et cetera, was stored either in an Excel spreadsheet, which was actually an advance over a scribbled piece of paper sitting in somebody's drawer, and Visio diagrams. I think what people are looking for is something that's a little more robust so that when I have to go about configuring my network, 
I can look at the data that is required to configure my network. I think that's where a lot of the discussion around the current focus on networking source of truth comes from. But I believe that that itself has a lot of history behind it in terms of, and we'll get into the details. So I want to kind of also make sure that I don't hog the uh, discussion too much. I have other people pitch in, but I think that discussion also gets into the way networking is done in general, including why do we have so many nerd knobs in order to do something? And I would like to also talk about how do other people who have distributed systems, because networking is a distributed system, deal with this specific problem and what is, common to them and what is unique about networking. I think talking about all of these things together will tease apart what we mean by the so-called source of truth that is the focus of this conversation and the agreement that in general, there is no single source of truth. There are actually many variations depending on what is the task you're looking to accomplish. I'll stop there and let others jump in. But just to complete that thought, for me, as I've been talking to a lot of people about this and thinking through, trying to think it through myself and kind of decompose it to the kind of the salient points, it's not just a truth for a given thing, right? It's also for whom, right? Who are the consumers of that truth? Uh, Because that really does make a difference. And then for what and when? So there's a time component. And I love how you mentioned, Nathan, right, that maybe this is a whole uh, a whole session, a whole conversation around the terminology. And mm. honestly, at Autocon, it was the first time I'd heard Source of Truth kind of used so broadly, which scares me because now we're having this discussion. We have to bring it back down to some of the details and specific truths that we're talking about. You know, design for me is is a source of truth, right? A, a, a T minus one source of truth, if you will, right? The first implementation is truth at T zero, Right. Yep. And then every change after that is a source of truth, every, a state, if you will, not a source of truth, but really a state at TN. Right. And so I, I'm trying to start to think of it that way, to be clear about where in that workflow truths need to exist. OK, so we are at the cloud phase of source of truth, right? Absolutely. <laughs> it means everything and anything. But <laughs> Clearly. Like, you both, like you both said, there is the ultimate truth as close as we can get to it, which is the network state. Uh, that is exactly how your network looks like, and you can call it the truth, but that's meaningless because who can say that your network is operating correctly or that it's configured correctly? So we have the actual truth and we have the desired truth, which is how you think your network should be configured and they can be in sync or out of sync. And the desired truth can be as nerdy as you wish. And I hope it's not because it's unmanageable. Just try to do, you know, SPF calculation in your head and let me know how that works out. (laughs) Or uh, it can be abstracted enough so that you can actually reason uh, around it with, you know, the limited capability we have compared to the SPF algorithm that's running on the routers. Hey, we have chat GPT now, Ivan. What are you talking about? I'm kidding. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, that was just to get you off your tangent. That's all. No, no, no. no. Please stay back. Get back on your, what you were saying. I apologize. I, that was just a dig. I had to take it you. <laughs> uh, so, so I guess we should, you know, just keep the obvious. The network is the source of truth because that's what's out there and everything else is, you know, just... M- in our imagination and let's focus on uh, what is it that we need to have some meaningful understanding of what we want the network to do. But it's a source of truth, right? And 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 people call that the source of truth because we have no better word. We can call it intent if you wish. No, please. I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's a source of truth, but uh, to Ivan's point, I've always viewed it as a two dimensional problem. You have the spectrum of, uh, you know, is the network actually your documentation or do you have offline that has the, the majority of your data? And then the second dimension is what are you actually trying to do? Because operators, for the most part, are going to want to look at the actual production network to know a link is down or not versus design and engineering is going to want to be more authoritative in when they're trying to put something in, um, in that they're using the correct numbering resources or whatever to make sure they don't break things. But um, uh, I think Claudia, to your point about a source of truth, I, I think that depends on scale um, and, 
and what we're talking about. You know, at at fairly small scale, um, a single repository for all of the different parts of your information can make a ton of sense. At massive scale, um, you know, that that breaks down. Um, you know, uh, so it, it depends on the size of your environment. Because I've been in environments where you know uh, a single amount of private address space um, does not cover the entirety of what you can build in one geographic <laughs> area. So yes. how do you handle the fact that you will naturally have totally overlapping um, address space? Do you make your IPv6? <laughs> uh, yes, but um, a, a complete erasing of everything that's already been done. It, that transition could be very hard, as we've seen in the production <laughs> network. But um, uh, you, you have to you have to factor that down into some set of uh, containerization for what area you're operating on. And so then you also have the fun question of do your tools need to understand that container or are your tools identical across each of those containers and the system that they're operating in is the one that actually resolves the container they're operating in to ask to 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 return the result of the question you're asking for can it get get me next ip get me next as things things along those lines yeah, yeah but honestly what you just described has been solved so many times in the past that you know it's a shame we are still discussing it but that's networking for you Yep, because that's exactly what every accounting service has to do. It doesn't have a ledger for all the clients. It has a different ledger for every individual client. But I guess coming back again, right, coming back to Ethan's question, why do we need one? We talked about that there are many and that there are some and they have different uses. But I think the fundamental point remains, it's what Claudia was talking as well, which is, for whom and for what purpose. And I think the main point again is if my purpose is to figure out is a particular link up or what is the state of a BGP session at this point, the network current state is the source of truth. But if instead I want to configure a VLAN and I want to know for this VLAN, what is the IP address because I have to configure the VLAN on multiple devices, then I refer to a different place rather than what is in the network as is today. So I think talking about what is the task at hand is really important. And yeah, so I think that's where coming back to, you know, why is source of truth important? Source of truth is important only from the perspective of it helps you answer the question that you're trying to answer. And from an automation perspective, there's a couple of ways to look at that. There's automation. Uh, there was a presentation at AutoCon Zero about uh, troubleshooting and using and, and automating your troubleshooting. Well, in that scenario, you're asking the actual network what's going on because you're troubleshooting exactly. a problem. You can't exactly. ask your intended state what the problem is. It's irrelevant. It doesn't really <laughs> yep. help you. Exactly. No, 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 wrong. The intended state tells you how the network state should be. So well, if you want to do could, troubleshooting, it, you have to compare the actual state with the intended state, and then you go like, oh, there's a difference. And, and it tells you whether somebody went in and manually made a configuration change instead of using your automation tool. So so yep. I, I support you on that assertion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, yes, point point taken. But but if you if you know, you also know the point that I'm getting at, if you're trying yep. to figure out what's really going on it's not helpful to directly query what you hope the network looks like. You do have to talk to the network directly to get to that, but, that point. Well, yes, you have to get obviously the to, 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 Yes. And then, 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 then your next step would be, all right, what, so the actual state of the network is this, is that what it's supposed to be? And then we can look at our intended state and, and go from there. Uh, was the, was the point that yeah, I was getting at you. Because, uh, <laughs> uh, no, Ethan, actually what you did was you just skipped one step, which is the intended state of the network is usually in your mind. <laughs> well, and so it, uh, it's really hard to do automated troubleshooting if the intended state is just in your mind. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. And that is the, 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 from an automation perspective, that is a challenge that most network engineers mm -hmm. and organizations are facing. What the network is meant to do lives in the head of uh, a small group of engineers, possibly one human. Uh, and if that's not codified in some way where we've broken it down into infrastructure as code or some other sort of representation of what the network is meant to look like, how can you automate? So I think you know, that that to me speaks to another question that Autocon Zero was going after um, you know, why haven't we made progress? Why is it so difficult to move into automation? I think that may be one of the root issues there. The difficulty that we have as networking and representing the network as code. Although much as 
much effort has gone into this over the the last decade, let's say. I guess I'll throw out there, but but also you, you, you trying to get the current active state of the network, given all the variabilities, and most networks are you know multiple ten years of old, and trying to get that documented, um, at least in my experience, doesn't often succeed. Um, you know where where I've had success in fully introducing automation is when we've been able to have greenfield. Um, so in, in yep. one environment, uh, it was the first deployment of a CLO topology. Um, so it was a complete greenfield. We could start from scratch. And in that environment, we were able to go and say, the configuration generation will be fully automated. We will be able to document the policy from the beginning on what we're trying to do. And that actually helped us, served us as we moved, you know, uh, 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 CLO topologies into other parts of the network, even getting to the point where, you know, we were able to go and have um, uh, embody all of our uh, external eBGP peering policy, which trying to document that to allow that to be fully automated, the <laughs> network that pre-exists, you know, is not successful. But if you're saying, I'm going to deploy a new uh, network design for how I'm doing all of that, it gives you at least a, you can bite off the, I only have to go after the peering that is going to land on yep. the new and allow it to ultimately replace the old. Yep. So David, are you saying that brownfield automation is a fool's errand? It is extraordinarily difficult. I have not seen it done extra, as successfully. I've seen it done piecemeal on the complexity of the network you're talking about? Well, it actually depends on whether you can get rid of exceptions. Yes, yeah, exactly yeah, you're, you're, right. you're spot on. Yeah. Well, and here's a question. We spent a lot of time, and, and the uh, I need to operate this uh, is an argument for so many of what I really think are, are bad habits that we have, that we all grew up with. And yep. so the question is, if... We had a standard, if there was no delta between, you know, T minus one, which I call design, right? And T zero, which is initial implementation. There is no delta there. And of course, we need to document both those two, if only so we can figure out if there are differences and figure out the delta. What does it look like now if, in fact, there is no difference? Do we have to use that whole, I'm doing this because I have to troubleshoot this at some point, Right. I mean, you hear all these uh, justifications for you know, I've got to I've got to care about this number because when it's not never documented. And so when I'm in here troubleshooting, I need to understand, you know, what port channel this is going to be or whatever. Right. Um, or what network this is going to be. If we live in a world where that delta is, if not zero, then much closer to zero than it is today, then are we still going to care about some of these things? That's the kind of kind of thought process I'm going with right now. I find myself. Um, I, I've been involved with uh, controller based networks, right? Where I didn't have an option for how the underlay got built. And you know what? It, it felt wrong initially, but after a while, I'm like, yeah, I don't care. I don't care mm -hmm. how, I don't care what IP address that switch has. I don't care about any of this stuff because, you know, I, I have a different way. And you guys talked, touched on this already. I have a different way. I've abstracted that out and I can troubleshoot. And in fact, I'm not troubleshooting the variance, which is what we spend an awful lot of time doing today. Yep. And, but I think independent of that, right? I mean, given that in any network of any size, there will always be differences between the fact that, you know, I think there is one aspect which is let's talk about the difference not existing for the fact that VLAN 1 and VLAN 2, uh, or rather VLAN 1 has a particular IP address. Maybe that will never be different because you've done automation correctly and everything is the intended state and the configured state look identical. There still may be problems that come about because of the fact that a link went down. And while the source of truth was fine, there was something that happened. Maybe it was a bug in the code, for all you know, that caused a different behavior than what you expected. So I think you will always need to have what Ivan said, this diff of wanting to understand what should it be with what is in the network to some extent to, understand, to begin where to start to look for a problem. Very true. But I think what if what if that diff was actual uh Issues like you mentioned, right? A link has gone down. We've rerouted, um, yeah. what have you, versus somebody didn't follow our Check. guidelines and yeah. misconfigured this. Yes. What does our I, world and what does the problem set we have to solve look like in that world where that first part, that that first set of diffs is near zero 
And you're only dealing with the my link is down set of diffs. Well, uh, you see, it looks like our life would become simpler. But did you ever try to troubleshoot a software bug in Cisco ACI or VMware NSX? Because, you know, today uh, we understand how things work. We know why the nerd knobs are there. And uh, if things start behaving strangely, at least we can look at stuff. I'm not saying modify it, but look at it and understand what's going on. And based on our experience, do some actual troubleshooting. If you get to the point where, as you said, you relied on the underlay working correctly and you don't care about the underlay as long as it's working, what do you do when it starts to break down? And things do start to break down and we know how quick vendors are to fix things. This is not AWS where, you know, if the network is down, they can't charge you for the VMs and the egress fees. So it's in their <laughs> best interest to have the network up and running. This is a vendor that has sold you equipment and didn't manage to sell you the support contract and they're running away. It's a very good point. And yes, I have been involved in those sessions where you are doing, uh, they're not, I'm not even going to call them packet captures, uh, at a level I had no business being in. Uh, so no, I, I hear you. Um, you're absolutely right. And maybe that's why, maybe we never will get rid of that uh, kind of uh, visceral, I'm sorry, if you obfuscate, you know, my troubleshooting, I'm never going to adopt anything new. I hope that's not the case. But, but I think that's not the problem, Claudia. I think problem that I see, as Ivan pointed out, is that we are asked to deal at different levels of abstraction depending on where we are and what it is that we are doing. At one level, we are asked to deal with, hey, don't worry about how the underlay works. We will just take care of it for you. You don't need to know whether it's OSPF or ISIS. But then when it doesn't work, what do I do? Do I have to still go down and look at OSPF and ISIS or do I have to do something else? I think a lot of the problem comes because the abstractions we deal with are not consistent everywhere. I mean, if you think about another area, it's like asking, I think, even though the analogy may not exactly hold, hey, you know, use compilers, but whenever you have to debug, you have to look at the assembly, which means I'm never rid of understanding the assembly. Whereas if you give me a line <laughs> assembler where I can actually look at the line in C or pick your favorite language, uh, line of code, then I don't have to understand assembly. Then I don't have to know whether I'm working with an ARM or I'm working with uh, an AMD chip. And I think the problem, and this is coming back at some level, I think maybe we have kind of diverged a little bit because we are talking about worlds in which uh, the uh, intended and the ac expected are not very different, so to speak, except for um, the actual runtime state, so to speak. But I think we are looking at sources of truth. But I think the problem is that even when it comes to sources of truth, the part that I would like to pull back to the first question is, first asking the question, you know, is there a source of truth and how many sources of truth is a question that's first, we got to ask ourselves, start with what's the problem I'm trying to solve? Because that helps us define what is it that we are trying to understand and what are we looking at a source of truth, if at all. The second part of it is to me, the fact that in networking, we like no matter how hard we try to rely not on tools, but on a system of boxes. We do not think of it as a system. We see it as a collection of boxes and thanks to vendors, thanks to tooling, thanks to operators, we have never been able to get away out of that. So when I introduced OSPF unnumbered, I say I introduced, I didn't. OSPF unnumbered existed long before me. But uh, when we did OSPF unnumbered in Cumulus, one of the things that I got, got pushback on was, hey, we use OSPF. We don't want to use OSPF unnumbered because the IP address tells me if I misconfigured. So the reason why they wanted was not because they wanted to number the interfaces. They were using numbering of the interfaces to solve a different problem, which is LLDP and CDP did not exist. And they didn't know how to cable the network if the cabling was wrong. So I think a lot of times coming back, rolling back to this question of source of truth, I think we muddy the answers many times because we don't focus on what's the question. And I think in asking how many sources of truth, et cetera, we need to go back to what's the problem you're trying to solve and who is the asker of the question, so to speak. So, so based on that, I'm not sure how far we're going to get with this next question because it feels like we've, we've made it so existential, there's not going to be a right answer. Let's pause the conversation for a message from sponsor Palo Alto Networks. 
2023 is a year when companies are going to need to do more with less. As businesses grapple with economic uncertainty, it's more critical than ever to consolidate fragmented security and networking solutions to reduce operational complexity and costs. Palo Alto Networks has a new virtual event on its Prisma Sassy, where AI-powered innovation takes center stage. You can watch this event on demand and see how ZTNA 2.0, Cloud Secure Web Gateways, and SD-WAN deliver exceptional security and ROI. Hear how the latest innovations in SASE can help your organization automate costly and complex IT operations with AI-powered digital experience management, connect and secure branch offices and the hybrid workforce with SD-WAN, ZTNA 2.0, and Cloud Secure Web Gateways, and unlock better ROI through consolidation of point solutions with Prisma SASE. Watch this event on demand at paloaltonetworks.com slash engage slash sassy dash signature dash moment. That's paloaltonetworks.com slash engage slash sassy dash signature dash moment. And now back to the podcast. But what I want to ask is this, in an organization with a mature network automation practice, what do network sources of truth tend to look like? Now we've alluded so far to really two Two big ideas with some auxiliary, but the two big ideas are the network itself is a source of truth. It has to be out of necessity. And we have an intended source of truth. That could be some kind of a off to the side representation of the network. Uh, let's call it infrastructure as code. There's something that's uh, representing the intended state of the network. So we've got at least those two. Um, if I'm a mature uh, network automation practice in my org, is d- does my network source of truth look like do i kind of rely on those two wells are those the two i'm drawing from or is there is there more well there's more it depends on uh, what level of abstraction you want to operate exactly. to start with and you have at least three different views of the truth as we already discussed you have the operational state which is are the links up and down what are the routing table yada yada then you have the actual device configuration, which you still need to, you know, keep track of for auditing, historical logging, whatever purposes. Mm -hmm. Then you have some high level thingy that describes the network at the level of, let's call it intent for lack of better word, where you want to mentally operate, which could be something like, these are the services I want to have provisioned. So the one dimension is at what level of abstraction do you want to operate? And the other dimension totally unrelated to that is how do you want to store that? Is it in relational database? Is it in YAML files? Is it in a Git repository? Is it in an Excel spreadsheet? I don't care. I think the question is not about caring so much as the fact as is it codifiable because all of this discussion is structured around the network source of, around network automation. I believe the grounding for a lot of the discussion about the source of truth comes from network automation. And your question, uh, Ethan, was in an organization with a mature network automation practice, what yes. do SOTs look like? So grounding it back in network automation while you, it is fine to have it in a sheet of paper scribbled and sitting in your drawer, it's not automatable. And I think the point coming back to what is a source of, uh, in a mature network automation practice, what does the NSOT look like? Rather than one thing, the thing that I would like to focus on from that perspective maybe is to say, there are multiple things that you're looking at. The first question is, there are multiple things to look at. David's talked about scale, but there's also the fact that today, firewall policy is stored different from the policy of what is the BGP peering number. The fact whether a user is allowed to talk on port 80 is stored in a different place than, and that's a firewall policy, but you know, a firewall policy is more device specific. There's a business logic that I was talking about in terms of a user that's stored in a different place. And then there is, of course, the specific box level that is stored in a different place. So I think in a mature network automation practice, if we start talking about all of them, the question becomes like Ivan said at 20,000 feet, it's very hard to have something meaningful in terms of a single source of truth. But if you narrow it down and pick a device, like a networking device, maybe the question becomes somewhat easier. I think Ivan's trying to jump in. (laughs) Yeah, no, Dinesh, uh... To use your firewall policy example, that's exactly what I was talking about. You can look at it from the, you know, the traditional view of this IP address can talk to that IP address on port 80. Yep. Or what I would like to see from the business perspective is these applications can talk to those servers 
using Oracle. Yep. Yep. But that's and quite that's, abstract. It's difficult. Yeah, but to that's the that. level uh, at which we should be thinking. Yes. Because honestly, do you care about IP addresses when not doing troubleshooting? You, you shouldn't, but that's what we've all grown up on. So it's yeah. hard to make that logical <laughs> leap. And also yeah, the fact that we talked about it in the source code, but that's a different story. But also the other part of it, David, I think we talked about earlier is when things break down, knowing that IP address matters because the tooling is not at the level that allows me to talk about is service A not talking to service B because of, because the tooling does not exist there. It exists at the level of IP address. So that's what brings us back again to part of the reason why we hold on to what seemed archaic is because of the fact that the tooling is inconsistent. And networking, sadly, has relied, continued to rely on do-it-yourself far more than it's relied on tooling, standardized tooling. I mean, one of the reasons, please tell me if I'm wrong, is the cloud operators became as efficient as they were because they built a set of consistent tooling. Um, no, they became efficient because they didn't have to deal with exceptions. Absolutely, that's part of exception, it. If they told you to go away. Period. Exactly. But I believe that they also helping them getting rid of exceptions also help them build more consistent tooling. I mean, again, I'll let David <laughs> jump yeah. in. He knows more than I do. So I would rather not put words in his mouth if he can yeah, say it I, at I, all. <laughs> you know, and and it's the question of what is the most important tooling. So what we keep dancing around is, is the automation, is it the active, you know, monitoring of the network? And so at least in my experience, you focus on, you know, what is the most important thing and you just continue to. And so, you know, day one, it was, uh, we're going to go build this new greenfield um, cloth apology. Um, we have to go and do the configuration generation for it. You get it into pilot production and you realize at scale, links break a lot. So this next most important thing was, how do I actually figure out what link is broken, why it's broken, what is parse, you know, discarding some infinitesimal number of packets, but it's still material. And so operational becomes important. The pendulum just swings back and forth between those tools as you proceed forward, um, yep. uh, you know, d building whatever service you're working on. So everything we've talked about has has those dimensions. It has the consumer, right? It has uh, the time, right, uh, and the function. Um, and so I'm I was really hoping, David, that you were gonna kind of impart the the tips on uh, how you manage source of truth the truths at scale. Um, <laughs> but uh, maybe the answer is not quite so simple. Well, well, it's not because it, it, so, so first off, it's, it's definitely multiple sources of truth, at least at scale, right? So, so again, uh, it, massive, massive scale. Um, the problem space is different than anybody else probably on here has, even at very large enterprises or extraordinarily large research university, right? Where I'm currently at. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the problem space that, that I've run into in the past is, um, you know, overlapping address space, uh, finding the right size of address space to go deploy things. And so, so we built separate tools. One was so, so I'm also a, you know, old school Unix person, which is you build one tool that does one thing extraordinarily well. You yep. solve it so that you have very little bugs in that space and you build another tool that does something very well and you use pipe to connect the two or APIs to connect the two. Um, uh, and, and the reason being is that also allows you to scale. So that sort of allows you to keep the two pizza team uh, model of some large companies yep. um, where I can factor that down into something smaller. So, so you have one spot that is potentially your IP database for a region. You have another spot that is your AS numbers for a region. You keep them separate because what you're going to be asking of them is subtly different. What you're going to be getting from them is subtly different. Um, uh, and so, that helps you then go build at scale. But this is also massive scale. For, for large enterprises, I don't know that you're running out of 1918 space. And so I don't know that you have to worry about that breaking into multiple separate um, subcomponents. Now, and the average consumer of network automation is going to be running uh, typically a smaller network there. Maybe they're a medium-sized enterprise. They're not going to have the, the scope creep concerns where they're going to want to have a very narrowly defined tool to solve a specific problem. They kind of want one tool that's going to do as much as possible and kind of their, their problem is too many tools and it's driving yep. them crazy. Yep. Very true. But I well, think although, coming back. 
Sorry, sorry the, the one other thing I throw out there, although, you know, in a in a university that's been around for for, you know, dogs years um, uh, when it comes to building networks like, you know, we currently have multiple separate tools um, that do things just because that's how we evolve. So we have one database that's our IP database. We have one database that's our autonomous systems. We have one database that's our BGP policies just because. Um, you know, with extraordinarily few developers, it was easier to go do that so that the the faults are more self-contained um, and, and allow you to, if you have to isolate something, because um, you can go make humans do something for a period of time until you resolve that tool getting fixed by the one developer that you're allowed to have. Yeah, but yet again, we are going into technical details. Yep. Because honestly, who cares how many databases you have behind an enterprise application or how many tables you have in a database? That's technical detail. That doesn't matter. I don't care if you store your IP addresses in a YAML file or if you store them in a relational table. As long as you give me an IP address when I need it or when I give you a name, you give me an IP address back. Yeah. I don't care how it's implemented. You know, I guess yeah. David's point was in response to Claudia, which is to say that they had separate ones for two separate mm -hmm. reasons. That's all. It's just a specific question that he was responding to. But coming back to your question again, uh, Ethan, which is mm -hmm. in a mature network automation practice, what do NSOTs tend to look like? I think what we are hearing is what we are all saying is that it looks a little different depending on the organization and it looks a little different from you know the perspective you're coming from whether you're coming from a service higher level perspective or you're coming from a device perspective but i th think coming back to i come back to saying why you know why what what are we trying to do with an nsot when we ask the question what does it look like i think we are trying to ask the question to an average layman if you take everything away i think what they are trying to do uh, I say layman, not layman, but, you know, a network operator, what they are trying to do is ask the question, I've been told that I have a tool X. Everybody tells me I got to have a network source of truth. What is, should I have it? I think if we kind of narrow it down somewhat more closely to rather than talking about the theory, the specific practice of a network operator, I think the main reason why people talk about a network source of truth is to store, as I see it, data about the network, which is, what is VLAN 50? Is it a camera VLAN? Is it a marketing VLAN? And what IP address is assigned to it? And the ability for people to go query that as a process rather than talk to Ivan and say, hey, Ivan, what is VLAN 50? Right? Is the yeah. camera VLAN. <laughs> no, that's always 42, I thought. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but anyway I, I, think the... you're, I think you're right, Dinesh, but I think what we're dancing around is the, um, for lack of a better term, the automation maturity of an organization. Because to Avon's point, if you are really, you know, uh, very, very mature, you are talking at business level. You yes. shouldn't care about the IP addresses. But if you're still starting out, you're going to be rooted in that IP address world. That's all you're going to have while you're attempting to then, you know, automate your environment. I agree with well, you, well, David, but I also think that the person who is dealing with a source of truth at that level of maturity is not listening to this podcast wondering, do I need a source of truth? I think the audience of this podcast at some level is a person who's asking, what the heck is a source of truth and why do I care? And I was trying to get to them in a particular way by saying that that's for that audience, what they really care about understanding is a separation of data from code in order for them to configure a device. But even there, they have to understand that they are being sold a bill of goods about a particular thing, but you have templates to actually configure things. You have code to configure things. There is version control around that. And there's a bunch of things even around the simplest set of things that you have to understand. So rather than in Ivan's words, putting focusing on the technical solution of whether it's in a YAML or a Postgres database, what does a mature source of truth look like? It looks like you've got all the data associated with what you need to configure a network in one place, one place can be multiple yeah. places at scale. You've got the data associated with how do I configure the template, so to speak, in a particular place, whether it's in the same place or different. And more importantly, you need some level of version control because I do want to know what's going on because you know what? I did a network refresh 
and now after having done the network refresh my source of truth tells me i should be in vlan 50 but right now i'm seeing something completely different and i've lost information about what vlan 50 was before the migration so i think maintaining the historical perspective is the other aspect of that so what does it look like it looks like having a place where you would have a source of data uh, so the, the data associated a place where you would have the code slash templates associated and an ability to have version control across all of them so that you can begin to start the journey of network automation i think you're missing one key point that you didn't say there sorry i just real quick you said yep. data so so part of part you mentioned not over data but also the metadata why sure. is why is vlan 50 important why is this yeah yep yep yeah. yep well uh coming back to the basics what you need is some data store and yet again let's go not let's not go into how that is organized it can be a mix yep. of different data stores but for every important bit of information you need about your network it should be stored in one place only the moment you start duplicating data you will run into problems I think that's the key part don't duplicate it so it's and not whether you second, store it in one or two yeah whenever you need that bit of data there must be some way of figuring out where it's stored and querying it yep. yeah quickly yeah. well yep. so here's here's what i always come back to um 5 6 years ago uh network source of truth was being bandied about as you know your list your estate right your your list of your inventory basically um so you know fast forward 6 years and i still see um different sets of data to even just represent that which i think we can all admit is a key component of this automation right but um the finance team wants a list of what they have on maintenance well, what if some network infrastructure devices don't get maintenance not on that list the network management team right wants a list of what to monitor so of course this is a box by box approach right the itsm or the change management team wants a list of cis the security team wants a list of things that they need to scan or not scan um and i honestly 90% of the time in the enterprises or in the um basically what i see is that those are all separate lists mm-hmm. back to the dimensionality we've been talking about for what who right and so because it's hard to develop that one list with all those things i mentioned being attributes right and and being able to query and the, get the view you want for the thing you're trying to do that seems to be incredibly hard the, the yep. issue with multiple lists and multiple places to find things goes back to Ivan's uh the point he just made about yep. data should only be stored in one place and as soon exactly. as you have multiple lists of things it's very easy to all of a sudden uh, well i really would like this column that's over here in this other place as well and then you got to remember to be changing it all and uh yeah. well you know that has been a solved problem in uh software development for ages uh, people yeah. did phd's on data modeling for <laughs> databases <laughs> <laughs> since 1960s it's only that we thought that we can ignore that because we are in networking why should we of care course. about data modeling uh, <laughs> on the other hand it's one of the hardest problems to solve yes so yep. given you know some ideas of what you need and deriving a good and stable data model out of that with all the referential integrity and all that that's like the hardest problem you you're facing in network automation everything else is peanuts compared to that Yeah I mean at some level you've seen some of that in real life with respect to the network lab software that you're building I've seen some of that with Suzy Q uh, and yeah trying to get that model right is hard but I suspect part of the reason why Ivan that model is hard is because of the fact that there is so many nerd knobs and each nerd knob changes if I believe you go up a little I don't know if you have got to have all of that level of abstraction Well, the nerd the nerd knobs as I see them are there to support your particular crazy ideas how yeah. your network design should work. Yeah. And they're not in the data model because you know, in a good data model you would just say I have these services, I have these infrastructure components, links, nodes, IP addresses, what have you. And then you have some business logic that compiles the list of services into as many nerd knobs as you wish. <laughs> In other words what you're really saying David I think I'm sorry Ivan is the other part which is I think instead of arguing a lot we have spent a lot of time arguing about intent and I think instead of intent what we are really saying is there needs to be a declarative way 
of talking about what is there. I think we pick as networking people, you know, they say, I mean, in, without networking, naming is the one of the hardest things. And as networking people, we seem to always pick the wrong name, at least a technology uh, generation behind in picking names. And I think what we are looking for is declaration rather than imperative. If we can declare that these services are the following, that VLANs, these are the uh, camera VLANs with these connectivity patterns, we can tend to start to abstract away some of the things. But we don't talk about declaration, we talk about intent, and that muddies the water a lot. Hey, it's a better marketing term, come on. Declaration was already <laughs> taken. <laughs> I thought the gray hair prevented us from talking any marketing, uh, excluding Claudia. Claudia will not talk marketing ever, <laughs> independent of whether she has gray hair or not. <laughs> okay. Th this, Again, another question where we didn't come up with an answer, although we had some some many good ideas here. Um, I think, Yvonne, you might have compartmentalized it nicely right at the beginning, that you're really looking at three different views of the truth. You've got the operational state, what's, what's actually going on in the network, the device configuration, which you could have configured a device to do something, and it isn't doing that because reasons, and then your intended uh, network state. Now, one thing we didn't really say here that I think would be nice to just throw out a simple example. If you got someone who's trying to come up with a single tool that is some sort of a representation of their uh, of their network and try to get it in, in a form of structured data, you could, and, and Yvonne, you've said, I don't care if it's a spreadsheet, if it's YAML file, as long as I can query it and get something out of it, that's fine. But for someone getting started, would it be fair to say Netbox would be a way to get started? Well, it depends on uh, what your goals are. If your goals are to have a user interface that you can then show to the uh, provisioning operators, then yes, something like Netbox is the ideal solution because it has a GUI. It allows people to enter things into structured forms and uh, you're good to go. If you have a smaller team, then maybe... You want to be more flexible, which brings us to the loved YAML mm -hmm. and using some whatever text editor as the text editor. But then obviously you will be making errors that the form-based entry would catch, which means you have to have more validation on the input or you will have garbage in, garbage out effect. The beauty of having something like a custom data model in YAML is that uh, you can define the network from whatever level of abstraction you wish. Yep. Whereas with Netbox and all the other things, which are really just glorified IPAMs. Yep. Sorry, guys. Yeah. yeah. No. Uh, yeah. They're, they're focused on that, yeah. solving a particular problem and they all started as IPAMs and inventory management. And then grew to be a DSIM that then grew to be, you know, a, a network yeah, source of truth with, with some marketing and some magic hand waving. Yeah, uh, whereas something like Cisco's NSO, which was tail F whatever before, yeah, yeah. they started with, let's have a generic high level data model and we'll give you the tools to define the data models and define the user interface to edit the data model and define the business logic to convert the your data model into device data model. And then we have the templates that convert device and data model into the device configs. Now, obviously that requires tons of customization straight yeah. out of the box. And no reasonably small enterprise can afford that. It's like, you know, trying to bring SAP into a small enterprise. Good luck with that. Uh, so realistically, if you are folk, if you, if the problem you want to solve is IPAM with a few bells and whistles around it, then yes, yeah, something like Netbox or any one of those tools could be the right tool for you. If the problem you're trying to solve is I want to define services on a high level and then have yep. some automated service provisioning then you usually have to solve it in some other way. And uh, the very first step as a pilot project is YAML. And then after that, it's a relational database where you have consistency and transactional consistency and all that. And for that, you need a UI to go in front of that, which means custom developed web app and so on and so on. 
I was going to say the one thing I would add is whichever one you pick, YAML or NetBox, and here is the benefit of YAML today, uh, and I believe there are other tools trying to do this, but you need version control. And I believe yeah. YAML gives you version control as far as I know, NetBox doesn't have well, it. Git, Git does, does, not YAML. Yeah, Git does, you're right. YAML uh, is just NetBox a way to get does. It. There is this plugin that uh, allows NetBox to work with something that looks like a relational database, but has version control built in. So okay. they have they have solved that problem with well with not a bot, not netbox, I think. Yeah, that's so, what I was going to say. I believe that is with not a bot. But, yeah, yeah. Branding. So yeah. Doesn't matter. But I think <laughs> the important part again, living out, leaving out what it is, is we need version control. And I think in all this discussion coming back, rolling back, if I'm a layman trying to understand, I want to start my network automation journey and I have been told I need a way to configure devices. So I need to learn Jinja to do templates. I need a source of truth to carry information about the data, so to speak, uh, to configure these devices. You do need version control. So telling them to, I would tell an operator, forget the specific tool, understand that you need to store three different pieces or four different pieces and you need version control for every one of them. Don't forget version control. I see version control missing in a, a lot of the discussion around sources of truth. Yeah, particularly with the IPAM products because they they never yes, had it. Yes, exactly. And so I think it's again important from a network operator's perspective to focus on the problem and understand the specific pieces rather than which how a particular product solves that specific piece. Yeah, you you get history with some of the products, depending. You could maybe go back in time and see the way things yeah, were well, at a particular Ethan, moment, but that's not the same as version control. Well, Ethan, I think you that's have, the point. Yeah, you have history with your bank account statement. Right? <laughs> and the only reason you have history coming out of a relational database is because someone coded the history in the software that's dealing with you. Yeah. So if the tool provides that, then you're good. But, you know, infrastructure from the infrastructure perspective, there is only one tool I'm aware of, and that's that relational database I mentioned that provides history and version control at the infrastructure level. Otherwise, it has to be solved in the tool. Yep. And the, I mean, at the end of the day, that database is a tool. But the point is, remains that you can add a timestamp and you have it, right? I mean, most of these relational databases don't have timestamps and it's a question of querying by timestamp at some level. But if you leave that part aside, again, I don't want to focus on what, but focus on don't forget version control. Whatever you're doing, don't forget version control. You need a place to store the data, what is a VLAN, you need a place to store the code, the configuration template, et cetera, and you need a place to have version control of all of this. And you can add additional levels of service that Ivan talked about. You know, there is policy at a very high level. I would say there is device config, device data, which is feeds the device config. And then there is policies. So Dinesh, if I can read that back, if we're talking about what folks, if they're thinking about building an automation framework around some kind of product, what they should be looking for is a repository uh, that works with a model or, or a template, has version control capabilities. And of course, it needs to be queryable. Is that sort of a fair yes. reading of what we're talking about? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And the model has to be custom customizable so you're not forced to think in the categories that <laughs> the creator of the tool, the tool thought you might need. Exactly. Doesn't that get us back down the nerd knob problem then if we're customizing our models? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I've been trying to build uh, just simple like Streamlit, uh, Solera front ends um, to very basic uh, things that... Uh, Customers do all the time, right? Uh, set up a port channel, uh, define a link, and trying to leave, trying to, uh, it's a test of mine, right? To ask the fewest questions as possible, only the absolutely necessary information, and do everything else on the back end. Yeah. To try and kind of reduce kind of that, that you know, you know, uh, shifting over time, um, kind of that drift that we we talk about all the time. And see how far that gets. I'll I'll let you guys know. <laughs> and Yvonne, my question was just me being. This is my turn to be a pedant. So sorry about that. <laughs> I think we got time for one more question here, uh, and that is this: uh, We've talked a lot about uh, code and then data, and as David said, even metadata. Okay, 
So there's a tension between those two from a network sources of truth perspective. If I am trying to understand this as a network operator, someone who wants to get into automation, how do I think about my code versus my data? Well, you see, there is this, the only reason we are thinking about this is because people were talking about infrastructure as code. And when you look at what that actually means, it just means that your configuration, whatever abstraction layer, should be machine readable. And that's all. It doesn't even mean that it has to be code. Machine operatable, yeah. Readable, yeah. operatable, yeah. Uh, so coming back, you know, I've been a programmer for the last 40 years or so. Uh, everything that we talked about today was mostly data. Your VLANs are data. Your IP addresses are data. Your services are data. Your DNS IP address is data. So everything we've been talking about is data. The only code we have are the templates. Well, is the code that extracts the data and prepares it in device uh, data model. The templates that you use to transform the device data model into actual device configs all the business logic that might go with it. So VLAN 50 must have IP address 10.50.something.something because that's my business logic. So that is code, but everything that you would store into a source of truth is data, if not code. But, okay, so I'm going to poke on that. So are (laughs) are the timer values data or code? Data. Okay. So it's not you, code. Well, but then well, it's but a parameter. Time value for like for like OSPF or something like that, Dave. Is that what you're getting at? Where well, you're... yeah, I, I'm getting at that, and the, and the in there because so if you if you treat it exclusively as data, you can run into problems where, as with uh, uh, you know certain timers, deploying the new um, information breaks all of the existing because the time the time values have to agree, and so you get into a spot where code has to be involved to help exactly. manage that migration. And so so there there is subtle areas that can be one or the other. And I think the, the uh, Ethan's original question is um you know is just the timer values just in my code because that's the easiest and most expedient or do I actually express it as data and I use the version of the code that I'm doing when exactly. I am migrating something that is that is mutually exactly. exclusive where the values have to be managed. Well, yeah. You know, to deconstruct that, the the fact that you are using three-second OSPF timer on this subnet, and if it's configurable, it's data. If it's hard-coded in the code, then it's obviously hard-coded in the code. The mismatch problem that you talked about, which is very real, is the product of duplicate data. If you define the OSPF timer on individual devices, then you will have a mismatch. If you define the OSPF timer on the subnet, and then you derive the interface timer from the subnet timer, then you cannot have a mismatch because it's only defined in one place. Now, obviously, you have the problem that some devices don't take sub-second OSPF timers, and others do, which is the validation code, because your data may not be valid. And obviously the job of saying, well, which devices are attached to this subnet and which of those devices uh, have these OSPF timer requirements and not the others, that's part of the validation code. The minimum and the maximum OSPF timer supported by a device is yet again data. And I don't disagree with you. I was poking on that, but I think that I think the one thing that, that this conversation is exposing is uh, for the people just getting into automation, how much are we suggesting that they boil the ocean, for lack of a better term? In that, um, you know, we've op- collectively we've operated or been involved in extraordinarily large networks where we have stubbed our toes many times and realizing what should be data and what could be code. Um, but uh, you know. Not everybody is going to be able to have the foresight to look far enough down the field in understanding exactly everything that they should extract out of their code and be able to then spend the time to generate the data that they would be leveraging 
to create the configurations that they want. And so the real lesson learned here that I'm going to throw out there is there is no perfect answer. And there are some times where you have to refactor the network, that is redo things, because you missed something. Um, don't beat yourself up for it. Just accept that you will miss something, even if you have perf perfect quotes, um, uh, uh, and, and just learn from it. Uh, quoting the mythical man month, the first system you will develop will be broken. It's just the question whether it has to be delivered to the customer. <laughs> but the other part, I think, however, is also, I was going to poke on Ivan from a different perspective. Everything we have talked about so far has been data, but I do think templates that we have is important and you need some way to code. store that. And I think that code that we are talking about, again, I come back to, you know, they make the statement, uh, power comes from those who do the defining and those who accept the definitions. I think today, a group of vendors are defining, and these are not maybe Cisco, Juniper, but they are defining what a source of truth is. And what I have been trying, and I think Ivan and David, all of us on this call have been trying to say is, look, focus on the job that you want done, and you will realize that there are three separate or four separate pieces. You've got data, which is what is a VLAN, you've got the templates, You've got maybe policies, and then finally, running across all of them is version control. So when you go look for what does a source of truth look like, think about all of them. And if you are looking for a single solution, then make sure that single solution is all of them. And if a single solution doesn't have all of them, it's important right now for you to think about how do I get the piece that is missing? Ivan, I have a question. Um... I like, I, I definitely like how you've kind of categorized data and code, but I was a little surprised, even, even the templates, the configuration templates, even, even though I was a little surprised because I, I sort of see that as data. You mentioned that if it's configurable, right, it's, uh, it's data. Well, I'm, I guess in my mind, a, a template is, is all configurable. I add this command. I don't <laughs> add this command, you know. So I just want to understand the attributes that you used to make that determination that the templates were basically code and not data. Well, uh, from the traditional software development standpoint, mm -hmm. users are entering the data and programmers or developers are writing code. So who is responsible for the template? It's actually the developer of the automation solution. It's not the end user. So it's code. Okay. Who can change the OSPF timers? Well, if they're changeable, it's the end user. Tutably privileged, yada, yada, yada. So it's data. I don't, I'm not sure I entirely agree, but I, 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 do, I do appreciate the distinction and that helps me think it through a lot. So thank you. What part do you not agree with, Claudia? That was my question. The well, <laughs> the, the the roles, right? The roles of who is who is doing it. I'm not sure well, I completely see, align, at least with my worldview. Ah, uh, you are saying that the user is not different. They are the same peer yeah. person. Yeah, I think they could be, and that's. Yeah. I think they could be, but I like the distinction. It's a good distinction to keep in mind. Well, you know, take five hats, put them on as needed. <laughs> in small teams, we will all be the network engineers, the developers of the solutions, the troubleshooters, the quality control, and the end users. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I like the distinction. It makes you think that discreetly about it. So, yeah, decomposing it. Yeah. Yeah. But just think about, you know, your junior engineer that you want to provision VLANs uh, half a year from now. He's the end user. So whatever he is allowed to touch is data because he has no clue what he's doing. And yes, and I'm trying to minimize whatever input I get from him to the the absolute extent possible. But yeah. And, and that's why you should do validation on all the data he enters. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, to come back to that question, if someone is just starting, where should they start? Typically, uh, you know, start small, figure out the three things that are bothering you most. Uh, it could be something as simple as I don't have the syslog servers consistent across my network. Yeah. 
So define the data model that describes the problem you're trying to solve. And with the syslog servers, it's really simple. It's one parameter in one YAML file. Let's move on. Yep. And then uh, figure out how you will deploy the changes. So you have to log into the boxes. You have to figure out what the existing config is. You have to figure out what the delta is. You have to figure out what the changes are. Then you schedule the maintenance window. You deploy the changes. What's the next problem you're having? Oh, the DNS servers. We almost did that with the syslog server, so let's redo that. What's the next one? Oh, the VLANs. For that one, we need a different data model. And so you slowly build from there. So yep. you're saying don't build, don't decide you're going to completely automate everything in my entire network uh, and course. then go for it, which does seem to be a common problem people have. Exactly. No, just identify the one pain that's hurting you most. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I like to look at tickets, right, for um, kind of provisioning tickets for things that gets done all the time. And I always recommend, hey, OK, you do like a new VLAN, you know, 10 times a day if you're big, you know, or, or whatever. Right. Um, let's look at that and let's look at what it would take to solve that in this kind of infrastructure as code methodology. And yeah. assume you're going to get it wrong, uh, Yvonne, like you said. Right. And let's learn from why it didn't work out as well as we had hoped. And do it better yeah. the next time. Yeah, what Avon just described, I saw work extraordinarily successfully in in, in that uh, you know this was a Juniper shop, so it was so basically what we were able to do was uh, allow automation to take over chunks of stanza within the config, and so the yeah. tooling owned the system, so it owned yeah. users and DNS and all of that sort of stuff, and then ultimately we built a tool that owned policy because we wanted consistent policy everywhere. The 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 spot where that kind of broke down was uh, in the eBGP peering because okay. attempting to try and get all of the business reasons for small, subtle nuances between peers around the world became difficult. Um, uh, and and it became such where it was we, the, 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 the value of the automation was lower than the amount of energy it was just having humans continue to uh, modify that policy. Yeah, but even there, you could say, well, I will give users the way of inputting the actual neighbor commands that are then applied consistently to that neighbor on that box. And if you replace the box, the same thing gets reapplied. So you effectively write a system yeah. that can deal with exceptions. Yeah, and to that point, um, the chain of policy commands was explicit on all peers. The variability was the peer AS had its own custom policy, but the, the things before and after it within the chain of policies were defined by the automation tool, and therefore that was consistent. And so we could manage the traffic engineering component of that specific peer. But I love that chunks of stanza uh, approach yep. because one of the things that drives me crazy is everyone has these monolithic configurations, just this, and fine, some of them are now in revision control, yada, yada, but it's just this big monolithic thing, right? And yep. it's like, no, no, yeah. you, you need a, a BGP section and you need an OSPF section, and, you know what yeah. I'm saying? And this yep. chunks of stanzas actually will incentivize um, people just starting out with building out their templates that way, which I believe is it, it has a lot of benefit. We'll put it that but way. I've talked to several people who've built their own automation, rolled their own automation in house, and the, almost that's a commonality. Everyone gets to a point where the monolith doesn't work anymore. They yep. break it down by yep. function. Uh, exactly. Routing's a function, BGP mm -hmm. specifically, perhaps, and NTP and SNMP, whatever it is. They've got all exactly. their different sections that they maintain individually. And sometimes they get broken down by device family from there because of the some unique mm -hmm. requirements of the different device yep. family. And, and so function. they have lots of little little bits of code and then some kind of glue code that depending on what they're trying to apply from where and to what that will bring up what the entirety of the change is. But that was something that they got to over a period of years. It took them a long time yep. to get to that. Yeah, part. it's it's hard to make that case. I, I think everyone says, oh, I've got a template. Uh, yes, it's finally in revision control. And by the way, that's just in the last couple of years, right? And called it a day. And it's like, no, no, no. You, because here's, here's a common one, right? Dot one X, right? I have different dot one X profiles for this use case than I do for that use case. Um, how, and you know, how do I automate that decision if I, you know what I'm saying? Um, so anyway, I love that chunks of stanzas approach. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna use that. <laughs> David. Uh, you know the 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 <laughs> one can't... thing that we all missed at what David said was it was a juniper shop. Yeah. Juniper is the only vendor that treats device configuration as a data model that you can edit and where you can remove particular objects or replace particular objects. And that's why this approach works beautifully because you can just replace the whole OSPF object and then it would calculate the delta and do the commits and all the other stuff. Whereas with any other network operating system, you have to do the diff yourself exactly. or use a yes. tool that does the diff. Fair and enough. then you go into the, well, I can't modify this because I need to modify that other things first. And, you know, all the dependencies. If anyone has ever tried to modify the policy map on Cisco iOS, you know what I'm talking <laughs> about. Yes, yes, yeah. you're right. But that's like uh, the of the beast, yeah. Yeah, only if you're out there, I can't claim ownership for the module-based approach. Uh, my coworker Sam at the time was the one that that saw that that was the right way to go do it. So yeah. he claimed he should get full credit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we did that model-based, uh, stanza-based approach in other places. And, you know, at some level, you can say even Ansible tries that with role mm -hmm. with a little bit of that. But it's not exactly identical. But, again, I think the one thing that someone coming on this call listening to this podcast uh, Ethan might get upset about is how many times all of us have said it depends <laughs> <laughs> we're Instead in IT we know that that's, just, <laughs> that's the reality it depends is, is just the way it is unfortunately there's no one simple answer there are ways to get started but with the understanding yeah. that your approach is going to evolve over time as you learn more about your environment the tooling your processes what's going to work for your organization what isn't things are going to change. It's the way it is. And you're probably not going to get it right out of the gator or you'll probably get it right enough, but maybe not as right as you need for the long term. And you'll have to make changes. But just start. Yeah. I think the most important thing we can say and we can encourage uh, to anyone listening here is just start, pick something small. I started with, uh, I wasn't even writing things to configurations, right? It was just like, let's, let's automate looking uh, to make sure spanning tree is correct on all these devices. All yep. read-only kinds of stuff, you know? Just start there yep. if you're not comfortable, but just start. <laughs> and also importantly, don't overthink the problem, right? I mean, if all you're doing is printf hello world, you don't need to understand object-oriented programming. So <laughs> start with simple <laughs> right. things. Don't go into something very complex. Back again, pick a syslog, pick a DNS, which is simpler. It's got one parameter at best. And so you're not overthinking because I think part of the problem starts with, oh, so I want to start. Oh, I have to get network automation, uh, network source of truth back to network source of truth. Oh, by the way, network source of truth requires all of this. And there's all this discussion about intended and expected and whether I should populate everything or I should. And back to network automation, if someone is asking you to manually enter all of the information, guess what? You're going to get it wrong. It doesn't matter. So start simple. This has been this has been good in a lot of ways. Very, uh, very foundational. I think um, this is one of those that's going to go into the Packet Pushers archives as a, as a foundational one, one you should really listen to if you're getting into automation. Uh, let's go around the table. Where can folks follow each of you? Claudia, starting with you. Uh, I have a, a simple um, WordPress site called the Gratuitous Harp, and I'm on LinkedIn. Excellent. Yvonne? IPSpace.net and on LinkedIn. IPSpace.net, LinkedIn. Uh, David Sin. Um, you can follow me on Mastodon at DSIN at Tech Hub, although I'm not, uh, I don't post a lot, but uh, definitely follow me on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, great. And Dinesh? Uh, LinkedIn and the Suzy Q Slack, I guess. Very good. Thank you all for taking the time to join in this conversation, for having great dialogue back and forth questioning and querying each other, sharing different perspectives. It's all been great. And thanks to you out there for listening to this episode of Heavy Networking. I've been Ethan Banks with co-host Drew Conray Murray. Again, you can connect with us on LinkedIn to keep up with issues of interest to IT engineers working in networking, cloud, and security. By the way, if Heavy Networking, this podcast, if that's the only one you listen to from the Packet Butchers, you should know that we have so many more as well as new series that we are adding. 2024 is a growth year for us with new technical experts joining us to share their knowledge and experience with you on network automation, security, and more. Check out our shiny new website at PacketPushers.net to discover our lineup of podcasts, blogs, newsletters, YouTube channels, Slack group, and other resources for your professional 
career development. Last but not least, remember that too much networking would never be enough.